Thank you and welcome. It's lovely to be here and lovely to see you all here. It's good of you to have come out on a grey and kind of miserable afternoon. So luckily it's cosy here. I'm delighted to be here with two incredibly distinguished and thoughtful guests. Um, I'm sure you know them both, but Lior Atta and Hannah Kent. And I've been, I've had the pleasure in the last few weeks of kind of immersing myself in their worlds. And because of the way that this talk is set up, the premise is that we learn a little bit about what a writer listens to and what a musician reads. So I've had a lovely time of not only just listening to and reading their work, but also getting to know the things that they love. And it's given me um, a great deal to think about. And it seemed to me that there are many threads that, that they have in common, but there were two things that stood out to me particularly about these two people. And they were ideas of um, empathy and compassion. I read and listened to quite a few interviews that Hannah had done, and she spoke quite often of empathy and trying to really understand and get close to another person's perspective. And of there are many things I admire about Leo's work, but one piece of his that's particularly dear to me is one that's called Compassion, which is a piece that he wrote with Nigel Westlake. And it's an extraordinarily beautiful work. And it seemed to me um, that this idea of empathy and compassion might be a good place and a way to start. And it might be quite timely in the world at the moment to sort of dwell a bit on those things. So welcome and thank you for coming. Um, why don't we start with you, Lior, if that's OK? I'd it's love okay. to know about, um, I suppose, how books and reading fit into your life generally, and then perhaps you might want to tell us about what I asked each of them to do was to choose something that was particularly meaningful for them. So to come up with two works that really had influenced their thinking and their own artistic work. So maybe you can talk to us a bit about the general picture and then a specific picture. Sure. Um, well, in terms of books, um, I by no means consider myself to have authority or license to talk to you about literature. Um, but thanks to the Wheeler Centre, I, I actually expressed that reservation to, to Genevieve before this. But I, I, I uh, decided to accept the invitation because I wanted to sit next to Hannah. So, <laughs> Hi, Hannah. Hey. Hey, Leo. So now that I got my starstruck moment out of the way, um, I, uh, well, books, I suppose, serve a dual purpose. One is um, I take my lyric writing very seriously. And so... Um, I find when I do immerse myself in reading, it, it sort of triggers that part of the brain that, that throws interesting words together so that when I sit with my instrument um, and try and let my subconscious spew out what's going on in my life, uh, I find that more interesting and poetic words come out. And when I'm not reading, um, it feels like a constant battle against cliché. Um, in terms of uh, selecting some, some books... Um, the first one that I'd like to talk about is called Religion for Atheists. Mm -hmm. That's written by Alain de Botton, who's one of my favourite writers. Uh, an incredible uh, modern-day philosopher. I, I think a lot of people label him a pop philosopher, but that, I think that's quite cheap. It's just because it's so accessible. Um, but that book came into my life at a, at a seminal moment. I, um, as you mentioned, I, I wrote a, a piece called Compassion with Nigel Westlake, and um, I didn't grow up... To be, uh, I didn't grow up a particularly religious person, but I always loved um, Jewish music and, and um, as a vocalist went back and uh, I always fell in love with some of the melodies that Jewish music has. And um, there was one piece in particular that, that, that haunted me. It's a piece called Avinu Malkenu. And um, I heard the melody and it stayed with me, but um, later in life I, I learned of its meaning. And there's a beautiful message within Avinu Malkenu, which says, instill me with a greater sense of compassion so that I can be liberated. And that link between compassion and liberation really resonated with me and I found it a beautifully universal and poignant message. And uh, so I started singing it and, and closing some shows with an a cappella version of Avinu Malkenu. Uh, Nigel contacted me uh, a few years ago and invited me to perform at the one-year... Uh, anniversary of the tragic death of his late son Eli, mm. and uh, which simultaneously also marked uh, the launch of uh, a charity mm. that him and his wife Jan 
uh, we're, we're launching called the Smugglers of Light Foundation. Uh, and it was a highly charged and emotive night, and at the end of the performance, I chose to finish with this a cappella oh, wow. rendition of Avinu Malkainu, and, um, which seemed to have a, a really strong resonance with the crowd that night. And it was only after the performance that I met Nigel, and uh, we entertained the idea of, of working together on an orchestral arrangement to Avinu Malkainu in, in stark contrast to the way I'd been performing in a cappella. Uh, and we presented that to the Sydney Symphony Orchestra as a short work and we were lucky enough that the orchestra artistic director came back and said, well, you know, we think this is a great idea, why don't you come back and, uh, with, with an idea for a full-length work? Um, which we were really excited by and then we kind of left the meeting and went, what, what are we going to do? What happens now? <laughs> so um, I knew that I didn't want to just uh, make it a, seem like a religious work and gather just a whole bunch of Jewish, te Jewish texts because that's how it would, it would be perceived as a religious work. So we went through a series of, of thoughts about it and eventually arrived at an idea which was to, gain, uh, to, to gather uh, a collection of ancient Arabic texts and, and ancient Hebrew texts from, from the worlds of Judaism and Islam and, and put them side by side and started writing melodies and orchestrations and threaded that through into a song cycle for voice and orchestra. But the reason I'm telling you this whole backstory is because uh, I really struggled with this whole idea of, of, you know, I want to draw on these beautiful cultures, this beautiful music, and, um, and I want to, you know, put across the wisdom found in these texts to draw from the, the beauty of the music that these worlds have offered us. But I really don't want to write a religious piece or a piece that's going to be perceived as a religious work. And I could not reconcile the two. I, wa I wanted it to be seen as a humanitarian work. Um, and it was just then that Alain de Botton put out his book, Religion for Atheists. And he starts the book by saying that he grew up you know, with atheist parents and he had an epiphany, which was that just because he doesn't believe in God doesn't mean that it discounts the fact that he can't appreciate and enjoy the incredible contributions that religion has given through you know, philosophy and art and music and culture. And he went off on a journey which was such a beautiful, con beautifully convincing journey um, about the way we, we, we can you know, feel that we can embrace these uh, contributions that religion has made. Uh, and so uh, I thanked him personally because it sort of made me feel... Um, you know, at one with what I was doing, and then I could, could let my hesitations go and embrace the writing and presentation of this work. Did it make you think differently about your art generally, in terms of where it fits within a broader context? Um, in, in terms of the book, uh, I don't think so. It was so yeah. directed at what I was at working on. that piece, on. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because one of the things, I mean, he talks about lots of things in this book, but one of the things he talks about is the idea of ritual and also of community, people coming together. And I was thinking about that on the way here too, thinking this is kind of a, a secular communion in a lot of ways, a group of strangers coming together to listen and to contemplate things that are essentially of the spirit rather than material things. And yeah, there are all sorts of very interesting ways of looking at how we could adopt a, a lot of those, um, not just thoughts, but ways of living and ways of framing our lives that I thought were really provoking actually. Yeah. What about you, Hannah? Does that have any resonances with you? Oh, absolutely. Um, I really love Elaine de Potten's book. I think it's extraordinary. Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot that needs to be, that needs to be really taken from religion. I sometimes, am, um, I'm, I'm not an extremely religious person. I don't go to church regularly. Um, I wasn't raised in a religious household, but there's a lot that I admire about religion, and sometimes it really saddens me when people, um, I call them fundamental atheists, they're so determined that everyone should see reason and adopt science as their religion and become an atheist that they neglect a lot of what is good and useful um, from about religion. And I think Elaine really captures that and really talks about that in a beautiful way. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary book if anyone hasn't read it. You know, whether or not you're religious or whether or you're an atheist, you should read it because it, I think, draws attention. So much 
ill is spoken of religion in this day and age, and it, particularly in our culture. And sometimes it's nice to look at actually what is what is beautiful about that, and also what we can take from it, whether or not we, you know, believe in Genesis mm. or the equivalent. Mm. Um, no, it's extraordinary. Mm. Yeah. Even the titles of some of the chapters I thought were lovely, like there's a chapter on tenderness and the idea of writing a chapter on tenderness I thought seemed important. And he talked, of, another one was about perspective. And that made me think about, about you and your book too. And um, I've, I've heard and read you talking about sort of not wanting to frame it as a historical novel and sort of wrestling with that, that line between fact and fiction and in essence wanting to tell a story and really wanting to inhabit the spirit of this woman. Mm. So that also made me think about some of those same ideas about... And I guess also that thing of tenderness, it felt to me that the way that you brought that woman to life for us was done out of a huge spirit of not just an amazing empathetic leap but such kindness you know we, we would we were taught to love her in a way and 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 he talks a lot about that in the book too that um that religion is a great way of encouraging us to be our our better selves mm -hmm. yeah, he has uh he, he's also extremely hum you know he's funny he's yes, really he funny, funny. And it's yeah. so awesome, he, yeah. he um uh, i remember there's there one point of the book where he says you know religion has a way of, of really reminding us of our insignificance yeah. you know and and coming to terms with that and that um you know, in stark contrast uh, to the, the advertising world that surrounded us is all about making us feel, you know, significant and precious, you know. And, um, and so he has this sort of, he, he presents an idea where, you know, in Times Square or something, instead yeah. of billboards, we should just have these, you know, philosophical captions of, you know, uh, how, you know, the size of the sun, you know, mm. the, 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 mm. or the light that it emits, just to remind us that we're insignificant. Mm. But I, I found myself, I was in Los Angeles, uh, a, a couple of years ago and, and um, just after reading the book and I looked up and there was a huge billboard and it just said fame is fleeting and I went wow someone's read Elaine de Botton's book it's amazing <laughs> and then it was one of those billboards that flips and then it flipped and it said but quality is timeless and it was an ad for oh whiskey God. oh <laughs> so like oh perhaps it, not it nearly worked <laughs> So Hannah, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, the music that you chose, particularly about um, the Laura Marling song? Well, it's interesting that we're talking about empathy and kindness yeah. and tenderness as well. Um, the, I, I really love the music of Laura Marling uh, for many, many reasons. I think she's a wonderful musician and I think she's an extraordinary lyricist. But the song that I chose to, for today um, is one that's rather special to me because I think it tunes into this idea of empathy. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a line in this song, um, I, won't, I won't go on about it too long, but there's a line which says, I used to be so kind. Mm. And when I first heard this song, that line really s struck me as being quite poignant because it seemed to, it seemed to suggest... A, a, that you know, we are all essentially so. You know, we're all kind people sometimes, occasionally. But sometimes, when we grow up to be unkind, there are generally reasons why that occurs. I don't think anyone is inherently, equal, you know, evil or wicked. I don't think anyone is inherently good. But I think that sometimes we need to be reminded that other people who are unkind had external factors contribute towards that unkindness. And when I heard that line in the song, "I used to be so kind," I thought, "Well, what happened?" And for me, there was, of course, the suggestion of a story and of narrative, but also that reminder that everyone, in many ways, is a product of the, their social conditions, um, the various consequences of other people's actions. And I think um, there's a reminder in that line to just remember that. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's an extraordinary... It's extraordinary. Uh, song and it also was one that I listened to a great deal when I wrote Burial Rites and you mentioned earlier that uh, you know the the way in which the book talks about this story of of Agnes Magnus Dottir who was in her time completely reviled mm. and and has been for many years afterwards mm. that position um, my decision to write about her certainly wasn't one of sympathy and I think sometimes we need to draw a very distinct line between sympathy and empathy we can't mix yeah. them up sympathy I think um, 
there's a there's a power dynamic when mm. you sympathize with mm. someone there's pity involved mm. empathy really is about i think empathy is an act of tenderness mm. it's about allowing yourself to completely inhabit another person's circumstance which might be completely alien to anything you've experienced so that you can share both their perspective but also understand why they have that perspective and therefore also interrogate your own understanding of the world and um and so yeah this this song with its reminder of empathy in that line i used to be so kind i guess whereas as, as i was writing the book reminded me to conti- to keep that perspective and to keep i guess that that ethos uh in the heart of what i was trying to do mm. shall we listen to it yeah please could we My husband left me last night Left me a poor and lonely wife I cooked the meals and he got the light And now I'm just due for the rest of my time For he speak because I can to anyone I trust enough to listen and you speak because you can to anyone I'll hear what you say I swear it was not my choice I used to be so kind There's just such a suggestion of, of story in Laura Marling's music. Mm. Um, so much is left unsaid, and I think it's all the more powerful for that. 
Yeah, and it's sort of shot through with longing and regret too, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. And yeah, there's a lot of that in in your character as well. Mm. Yeah. And also the fact, you know, I speak because I can, whereas mm. your poor woman can't. Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it also, I think, is, you know, for me anyway, the way I, I listen to this song is anyone, um, I think it's, it's int- everyone has their own story, you know, everyone has their own bag of rocks, as some people say, everyone has their own burden. And, um, but you know, not, they can't always have the opportunity to tell their side of the story. Mm. And often still in contemporary culture, we shut out people's stories or we don't want to listen to them or they won't tell them because they don't have the trust there. And again, I think that's important to remember whenever you hear um, a condemnation of anyone, really, no matter what it is that they've done. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there'll always be another side to it. Absolutely, yeah. Or many. Exactly. Fact. Yeah. And they're all true and they're all conflicted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I was wondering about Hannah, because um, Hannah kindly sent me a link to a website that does really interesting things and basically asks writers to uh, compile a playlist of music that sort of is related to their book. So that was a great kind of musical snapshot for me of your listening habits. (laughs) And that combined with um, an interview that I read where you just happened to mention that you used to play in an Irish folk band. I knew this was going to be brought up at some stage. I was intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, tell me about that, please. Because this, I mean, in essence, what we listen to, to me, is that's contemporary folk music, isn't it, really? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's funny. Um, when I had to think of what music to bring along today, um, I was thinking, gosh, you know, it's all very folky. But then I was thinking about, you know, growing up and what sort of music I listened mm-hmm. to, and it seems, a com- you know, completely natural that I should end up listening to someone like Laura Marling. Because, um, you know, the, the lullabies, well, I thought they were lullabies that my father used to sing to me were actually Peter, Paul and Mary. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I inherited a whole bunch of uh, um, albums, actually, from my, my, my mother's sister, who I never met. She died when she was 21, and uh, she was a writer. Um, and she had Cat Stevens, and she had Simon and Garfunkel, and Don McLean, and I just completely, these were my first loves. I completely fell in love with these people growing up. And then um, I remember, you know, I had already such a strong grounding. And I guess you could say it's certainly singer-songwriters with elements of folk there as well. I used to listen to a lot of Irish music. My father used to sing me a lot of sort of Irish songs, again, as his lullabies. And um, I went along one Christmas to a local carols sort of night. And there was a little group there singing, and they were mainly children, and they had Irish instruments. You know, they had the borans and the tin whistles and the fiddle. And I just remember just hearing it going, I have to join this group, I have to do it. And um, they were local in the Adelaide Hills, and I ended up joining what was called the We Folk. (laughs) We were about, um, I, I think our largest, we were eight kids, ranging from probably eight years old to 16. And I stayed with them for many, many years and we used to go around and tour and do all the folk festivals. And in the end, um, when I was about 12 years old, I started playing the drums, the drum kit. And so we started to slowly incorporate less traditional Irish instruments like the drum kit. We thought we were the cause, you know. We were like, we were like the Irish Von Trapps. Um, and then, yeah, we eventually had a saxophone player, but that didn't really stick. We, but, you know, it was great. I mean, it was a wonderful sort of way to learn music because we memorised everything. Yeah. So while I can read music, I do it very badly and I certainly can't play and look at it. I have to learn it by heart. Mm. And I mean, Irish music is, is fantastic. Yeah, it is yeah. fantastic. You just so try and play fast. It's great. Did you play the boron? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. And did you sing as well? Yes, badly. But yeah, um, yeah enjoyed the drums best. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was the drummer by, by the time I left mm. at about 16. Because mm. then I was reading that you, your next book is Irish. So I thought, oh, well, oh, you see, there are patterns. Yeah, there are, aren't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Sorry, I did have to ask about I know, the Irish I'm folk. I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to reveal about the yearly or it's disappointing. Oh, well, not but yet. But I'm sure anyway. you can do that <laughs> yourself. <laughs> do you want to tell us about your second book? Yep, the uh, second book I chose was uh, is called When Nietzsche Wept, yeah. and it's by a writer called Irvin Yalom, who is actually a professor of uh, psychiatry mm. at Stanford University, and um, and has put out a lot of books which are more case analysis books uh, of, um, of uh, his uh, psychotherapy, you know, accounts of his meetings of psychotherapy sessions with his clients. But this is a, a, the first book that he really fused fiction and, uh, and his sort of philosophical 
um, musings and um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm a bit of a sucker for books that have philosophy at the core, you know, mm. uh, and I think this one just struck me as the most beautiful fusion of philosophy and fiction. Mm. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? And the other thing I thought was interesting, I mean, it was sort of 70 years difference, but yours was set in the 1890s and yours was in the 1820s, mm. 30s, so I thought that was interesting too. So you, do you want to tell a little bit more about the sort of story behind behind? I'm just going to look up Wikipedia. Just yeah. so <laughs> uh, well, just, you know, big picture, um, uh, he sets up uh, a, f a fictional meeting between yeah. Dr Brewer, who... who uh, was a famous Viennese uh, psychiatrist Physician, at the yeah. time and known as one of the founders of psychotherapy, um, yeah. and, and Nietzsche, the philosopher. And the, the uh, meeting is uh, mediated by uh, a woman who uh, is, was Nietzsche's lover and, um, and believes that uh, while Nietzsche suffers from all these physical ailments, he is uh, um, uh, suffering from extreme melancholy, partly due to heartbreak over her, and she sees that uh, as risking the future of German philosophy. Mm, exactly. So she convinces Dr. Brewer to pretend that he's, uh, to treat Nietzsche in the disguise that he's tre treating his physical ailments, but really to embark on a series of, of talk therapy mm. and try and cure Nietzsche of his mm. melancholy. But what happens is that through these philosophical discussions, we learn that Dr. Brewer himself is, is uh, obsessed with, uh, with a former patient of his, and which has led to the demise of his marriage. And, uh, and so uh, it becomes this uh, series of uh, philosophical talks between the two as they uh, continue to heal each other without mm. realising that the, other, mm. the one is trying to heal the other. Mm. So it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful sort of uh, you know, mind game, story mm. of mind game. Yep. Yeah, it's a kind of meditation on, on friendship and trust as well, isn't it? Because it's the two building this rapport and, and one of the things that... You know, lots of layers in it, but... There's deception on both parts, and, That's right. and gradually they learn to sort of unmask and, and they dare to to fess up to one another, really, don't they? That's it's, right. It's That's right. And I was thinking about why, yeah, you know, well, that's why I question. chose those. Why? Well, I was thinking about what yeah. those two books might have had in common, because you know, you kind yeah. of when you start thinking about why am I drawn to these books, and I think I think Yalom, they they both Boton and, and Yalom, they they deconstructionists, you know, that Yalom. Uh, really takes the human condition, human behaviour and all the facades and veils that we build around us and, and he, he deconstructs them into the, you know, the, the basic foundations of, of existential psychotherapy, which is his thing. Um, and the way he does it is beautiful. He just strips everything away and uh, you, you pretty much realise it all ends up, you know, being a, some sort of crisis in, uh, you know, fear of death, isolation, mm. you know, a search for meaning. Uh, and mm. he does, does it in a beautiful way. I think de Botton probably does that, is more interested in doing that with um, institutions and so mm. society, you know, things like religion and, and status and, and he, takes, he takes big society sort of um, topics mm. and he continues to, to then break them down mm. and, um, in, in much the same way. Mm. So I, th I thought, oh, that, that it's, it must be the process of mm. that deconstruction that I enjoy. And that story, the second one you've just been talking about, or that book or that kind of thinking, how did that then sort of bleed into your own work? I think a lot of my own lyrics are philosophical musings. Yeah, that strikes <laughs> me too. Yeah. Um, when I think about it, little catchphrases of, of, um, of philosophical, you know, insights or snapshots. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, lyric writing is, is very different because it's all about, you know, economy. It's like what yeah. you're saying, it's about what you don't say. Mm. Uh, you have to be as efficient as you can, mm. um, preferably multi-sensory, you know, mm. Which I think I think actually Hannah, you'd be a great lyricist because mm. <laughs> you do that so well. I, you know, when I read Burial Rites, I think it was the first page. You describe a um, a candle as greasy bright, mm. and I just love that. It's just those two words evoke so mi so much, you know. And and that's I think the secret to good lyric writing is you don't have much space, you know. Um, but you also the music will, you know, if it fits, it will enhance enhance the the emotive um, power of of sometimes very simple words, mm. which if they were just spoken, they wouldn't really resonate. Mm. And, and that, that continues to intrigue and fascinate me to, mm. to lyric writing. Mm. So will you often start with something big and pair it back? Or is it, wh what, what's the essence of, I mean, I'm, I'm still, sure I'm still developing a, a style of yeah. lyric writing because yeah. the way I write is often led by the music. You know, mm. I'll, I'll work on a musical idea and, and 
uh, try and get into a zone where my subconscious is actually spilling out words. And it's quite amazing that it, when you can get into that zone, which is a very difficult thing to do, mm -hmm. actually, um, I find, um, mm -hmm. it's amazing what your subconscious just puts out. And you just mm -hmm. kind of go, oh, what was that? And you go, oh, actually, yeah, that is kind of going on in my life. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think a lot of that is trying to kind of fuse the conscious and mm -hmm. subconscious. So the, um, mus the, the music often leads you in... It does, but as yeah. you said, sometimes uh, it does help to just write what you you know what you want to say, and then just like a book, you know, edit it later and yeah. put the pieces of the puzzle together. Mm. Mm. Um. It struck me reading you, Hannah, that, like it doesn't surprise me that you grew up listening to a lot of music because your writing is so musical. I think, mm. like, oh wow, thank yeah. you. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, <laughs> it's meant as one. Oh, yeah. thank you. It's yeah. um, it's funny you mentioned that you know. Um, the way in which the, the lyrics are necessarily so sparse and, 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 and need to be suggestive and because it's the concision of so many, uh, of, of so many lyrics in the, in the singer-songwriters that I admire, which I try to capture in, in my writing. I find it hugely inspirational, you know, because you don't... I think there's some... It's, I think of it... The, the music that I enjoy listening to, I think of as almost impressionism. You know, it's a well... F it's well-placed brush strokes and you bring your own experience to it as well. And, of course, you have the music which lends the atmosphere, which, of course, you have to create in a slightly different way. But it's certainly that which um, I find hugely important when it comes to sitting down and writing. And you talked also, Leo, of that... the need to sort of fuse the conscious and the subconscious. Mm. And I often find that when I sit down to write... I'm too conscious of what it is that I'm doing. And I listen to music quite often to, I guess, um, to coax out that intuitive side. Mm. I think there's something um, slightly intangible, slightly ineffable about music which allows you to do that. You can forget yourself, and I think that's really, really important when you want to be creative. I don't think, um, I don't think you can, unless it's an autobiography or something, I, I think it's really important to not be too analytical about what it is that you're writing or what message it is you try to convey. Often you're just trying to push forward an emotion or what you're trying to feel and, and you can edit that later and make sense of it. But it's a difficult place to get to, that point where you can just write and hope that you're conveying atmosphere, that you're conveying a depth of feeling. And music, musicians do that so well and that's really, you know, what I would ever... So that's what I aspire to. And that's why I listen to music when I write. I know a lot of people don't. Mm. Um, and in fact, I didn't for many years because I thought that was the big no-no. You know, you must write in silence so you can read aloud and hear the rhythm of your words. And I've, um, I've completely disagree now. I listen to it pretty much always. If I sit down to write, I'll definitely put on music. And I think, yep, that's okay. That's what I need to do. I need that concision and I need that same depth of feeling. Do you not find that the words of the lyrics that you're listening to, which might be portraying a completely different world mm. um, interfere with yeah, you trying to pinpoint too. the yeah. world that you're trying to write? Generally not, because I think by the time I sit to write, I'm, I'm ha inhabiting the world that I'm, that I'm writing about. And I find generally... Like with that Laura Marling song, I mean, that's probably about something completely different, but I was able to take that line and make it relevant to, what, to my story and my narrative. The, but the other thing I do, in fact, when I find it distracting, and it does happen occasionally, especially if I'm not familiar with the work is that I, I listen to it on repeat over and over again until I stop hearing the words. Mm. Um, yeah, and I take something from that. Mm. That's fascinating, because I'd, I'd read you writing that you often use music as a way of sort of getting you out of your domestic daily life mm. into a creative state, but I hadn't realised that then you, you kept listening. Often, yeah. yeah. If, I get, if I get a bit stuck or, again, I'm becoming... Yeah. I'm, I'm losing that subconscious element that you need or I'm losing that intuition... I'll, uh, I'll stop and I'll listen to music and then I'll often c start writing again while the music keeps yeah, playing. Yeah. yeah, just pulls you back into the creative zone in a beautiful way. I'm not sure. Still don't really know how it happens, but I know I'm grateful for Doesn't it. Doesn't matter. That's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. It made me think, too, the second song that you've chosen is not in English. No. Does it help? Like, d d do you often gravitate towards things that, that are in, not in, not in another language or are slightly more abstract or... I guess the other thing that struck me is the the two things that you chose are both hugely atmospheric. They're yeah. very sort of evocative, so they sort of conjure up a world, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And that is the other thing I do. If I know I'm writing a particular scene or I, I want to convey a particular atmosphere, um, 
I'll pick a song that I know has something close. And I, I guess my, my idea is that I'll absorb it by osmosis somehow mm -hmm. and it'll be there in the writing. And I think sometimes that does help. But yeah, I, I think just generally I like to listen to atmospheric music because mm -hmm. the, it's like a good book. You know when you pick up a wonderful book and you see it, you know, you can see it mm. before your eyes like you see a film. I have the same effect with music. Mm. Um, and often what I'm seeing is something that I will then want to go write about. Mm. It okay. adds a visual element, I think, often, strangely enough, to what I'm writing. And that's yeah. interesting. So when you hear something, you see something. Yeah. What, when you hear something, what happens? Do you see things? Um... No, I don't think so. Oh, I see, see, now I just think yeah. crazy. <laughs> no, it's interesting. <laughs> no, I think, um, I think it's about feeling, yeah, actually, for me more too. for me. And, and yeah. uh, the best lyrics I've written, I think I can pinpoint what I felt mm. that led me to, to write that. And mm. I just felt like I have to quickly seize that feeling and just spew out mm. the words right there and then because mm. it's, in the, it's in the midst of that intensity of feeling mm. that, that the best words will come out mm. because it's less likely to be, you know, um, inhibited by, um, you know, self-critique and mm. self-analysis. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Hannah, do you want to tell us about this next song? Well, the next song is by Sigurós, uh, which is an Icelandic band. Um, by the way, Hannah, you're probably the only non-Icelandic fan of this band that can pronounce their name <laughs> correctly, right? Yeah? Yeah. H how do you say their name? Sigurós. That. Yeah. That, that yeah. one. Them. Um, it's, it's a ridiculous piece of music actually to choose because it goes for six minutes so we might have to cut it off a little bit earlier. But it's a, I think it's a beautiful example of the sort of music this band produces which is to say hugely atmospheric and really um, quite personal for me because you know, living in Iceland and having completely fallen in love with that place but with the landscape particularly, mm. as soon as I listen to Sigurós I see the landscape and I know... Um, Many other people have had the sim a similar experience. If you have, if, if anyone here has been to Iceland and you haven't heard Sigurós, I can almost promise and guarantee you that you will, you will feel that landscape again and you will see it when you hear them. It's I don't know how they they managed to do it. It's really quite extraordinary. They've captured the soul of the country um, in in the kind of music they produce. And this is um, one song which is in, it's actually in Icelandic, but a lot of the songs that Jonsi, the lead singer of Sigurós sings, are in what he calls Hopelandic, yeah. which is a weird sort of Icelandic gibberish. Um, but I think that's beautiful because yeah. it's about, you know, for him lyrics aren't necessarily important at all, but it's, the, it's again, the, the emotion um, behind just the the sound. Mm. They've actually yeah. put out a film, haven't they, which is just yeah. scenery of, of Iceland mm. with their music. Mm. Yeah, it's called Heima, um, mm. which means home. home. Yeah. 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 I thought that was interesting too, though, the way he used text, that um, he uses it like a colour yeah. rather than actually as a storytelling device, which of course appealed to me because I'm an instrumentalist and so that idea of it sort of being another abstract thing that you can paint with, I thought was really interesting. Well, I think anything that's slightly abstract, uh, uh, you know, there's space there for you to bring yeah. your own interpretation and your own experience and to to whatever it is and therefore make your own meaning out of it. It's always somehow slightly more relevant to you. It feels more personal, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Can we hear a picture of Iceland, please? Thanks.
feel so mean turning them off. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautifully dreamy, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny, I've seen them play live. Um, they've, they've toured Australia quite a few mm. times. And something which isn't uncommon in the audience when they play is people crying. Mm. And I've often really been struck by this. And I think it comes back to there's something, again, ineffable about their music, but something so soulful, at least mm. I find it. Mm. It's almost like a prayer, you know, in the same way that it's some kind of communion goes on there and it, you can't explain it and you can't rationalise it. And it's about emotion, I think. And again, people bringing their own, whatever's going on in their life to the music and the music playing it back to them. The other thing I think of when I listen to that, just purely in musical terms, is that they work in that world of electronica yeah. incredibly well. And so a lot of the sounds that they're producing are may have started as acoustic sounds but then have been manipulated in all sorts of ways mm. and something about that sound world that to me is brilliant at conjuring up landscapes yeah. and particularly at conjuring up really big spaces there's a sort of a cosmic enormity about that palette yeah. that they do really well and I was thinking about that it seems to me that the, Musically, the people who are most interested in that kind of language, it's quite a cold country thing. Mm. Often it, that sort of music is coming out of places that have long, dark winters and where people are very um, marked by the landscape because it, it dominates their lives in oh, interesting ways. I completely ways. agree with you. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily always beautiful music either. I quite no, like the ugliness that you find in music like that, whether it's a slight screech or a crunch or... Yeah, it can be pretty stark. Yeah, absolutely. Just, again, like that landscape. And mm. I was thinking I couldn't really think of a lot of artists working in that field who come from places that don't have those long, dark winters. Mm. Um, yeah, you're under something there, I think. I lived in Scandinavia for a while, so I, I've thought a lot about mm. how those seasons change the way you experience the world mm. and I think that was so amazingly strong in your book that sense of the like it was so visceral what that land does to you quite mm. apart from you know it's elemental beauty but mm. it it shapes you you have no choice but to orient not just your life but a big part of yourself around absolutely the, absolutely yeah. there's um there's a phrase that I think I've quite quite a lot when I write and it's um, it's not mine it's the US writer Ron Rash who also writes landscape coincidentally you know beautifully and it's um, landscape is destiny and I often think about that and you know when I'm listening to Sigurós and I'm trying to convey for instance in burial rites the Icelandic landscape and I'm thinking you know first of all how do I represent this way in a way that is true and beautiful but also captures hostility mm. but also to show how it shapes and mm. moulds the people who live amongst it so yeah, it's all connected somehow, mm. but I think, yeah, you're definitely onto something there. Mm. It's, that com it's that element of hostility, of discomfort, or of um, brutality, maybe. I'm not sure. There's a raw quality yeah. to it. And yeah. a kind of strange beauty. Yeah, it's ethereal. Mm. 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 Yeah. I fear we might be coming close to the end of our allotted time. But... um. Did anyone have any thoughts to conclude? It's been uh, lovely to be here. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Leora. <laughs> <laughs> I should say that I was really nervous about meeting Leora as well. I was consciously trying not to fangirl in front of him. <laughs> the hugely intimidating presence that I am. <laughs> yeah. It's terrifying. <laughs> the really lovely thing about coming to the end, quite apart from saying thank you for being here, and thank you to our most excellent hosts at this beautiful venue, the substation, as well as to um, the wonderful Wheeler Centre, who are the reason that we're all here. The lovely thing about coming to the end is that we're really lucky. I believe Leo might sing something for us. So we thought sure. that would be a beautiful way to finish. So thank you for coming and thanks to our guests. You'll have to tell us about the song, Leo, if you don't mind. Yeah.
Oh, I've got the guitar here, Hannah. If you wanted to get up for a song as well and play us one of the songs from your Irish band, I should have brought my Boren. <laughs> Could have just drummed behind you out of time. So, thanks for coming, and thanks. I think before you start, can we all say thanks to our beautiful guests? I wanted to uh, play a song that is called "My Grandfather." It's a biographical account of my grandfather. And my story with him, uh, it's off the latest album that I put out called Scattered Reflections. When I was born, my grandfather held me in his warm hands. And it seems though his eyes are teary, but it's hard to tell from the old photograph. While my brother and sister danced at the feet of his tired and weathered frame, he said, there's a light to this boy I've rarely seen, and there he gave me my name. Well, my grandfather was a sniper in the Red Army. He never knew any brothers in arms, for on both sides stood enemy. With a cold, unbroken will to survive, his steady hand took aim. And he drank just enough to keep himself warm, for he never spoke his true name. Mm -hmm. When I was a boy, the summers were ours He would take me down to the sea He'd stand on the water's edge and watch me go crazy As the gentle waves rolled in Looking back, I wonder how he must have felt Watching me running so free all the years in his life he wished he could forget Did he look at the world through me? When I was a man, I flew across the ocean When I heard he needed care I listened as he spoke of his turbulent life From his ordinary chair And he ended by saying Oh, I've had enough The time's come for me to go I have only one wish that is left in me To be taken peacefully just before I was due to marry, I heard he could not walk anymore. It was then he gave up fight, I had said goodbye almost one year before. And I'll never forget something he told me Yes, it's a cruel world, but you must live without fear Well, I sure do miss my grandfather He's the reason why I'm here Thank you.